Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland, an Arsenal podcast. I'm Gunnar Gimli and tonight I'm going to be joined by... First up, he's our co-founder and my partner in podcast crime. It's Danny the GFP. Hello, Danny. Uh, you got nothing better than that? Well, you meant to ask me how I am. I, I did. I said, are you all right? Uh, my health is not in question, but all I'm going to say is I have a, a swollen anus, like a $2 whore, after a buy one, get one free weekend. <laughs> and if you've not turned off already, <laughs> next up is a man I will introduce to you only as Strutter. If you mess him about, he's going to come and fuck you up. It's Gav from She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. I just want to mention I've not been anywhere near Danny. <laughs> I'm on painkillers for my elbow and my neck and my Nothing knees. Nothing to do with me, mate. I haven't yeah, no. touched him in no any way, shape me. or form. Painkillers stop you from shitting. He did say he could stick his thumb up there and wriggle it about, so maybe it wasn't you. <laughs> right. Our next guest joins us all the way from sunny Poland. It's Steve, Mr. Lord Hillwood. Hello, fella. Hello, hello Gim. How are you doing? Oh, I'm not too bad. I haven't had faggots this week, but... Uh... No, yeah. I'm sure they've had you, though. Uh, <laughs> it's not so sunny out here now. It's getting to be autumn. I've got the winter thermals out. I've had them in the washing machine. They're ironed. They're ready for action. Oh. When the thermometer tips to the dreaded minus 25, and it's, it's genital retraction time. Well, it sounds, <laughs> sounds delightful. I'll, I'll right. get, a, I'll get a taxi to the pub and back. That's nothing like living the dream, is there? <laughs> Next up, a podcast favourite, and back again to keep Strutter in check, it's Mr Raj Patel. Hello, Raj. So we've had a swollen anus and genitalia already in the first three minutes of this podcast. <laughs> uh, I, hello, how are you? Um, not too bad, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, good. Looking forward to this. Full of cannelloni. It's, it's nice of you to, uh, to agree to join us again. Always the bridesmaid. <laughs> oh, oh, right and finally making his podcast debut it's jules or on twitter you may know him as rider of rider of rohan hello uh, hello jules hello how's it going yeah not too bad that was a bit of a mouthful gav yeah. don't say anything <laughs> I heard you're used to a mouthful, though, you know. No, well, if Gav's told you that, he's, he keeps... Well, that was Danny, actually. But... Yeah, he keeps telling stories about me and then palming them off when they're really his own stories. Uh, oh, deflection. Big toad Welsh fucker. Hey, oh, I'm nothing... surprised you missed out on Ginger. There's nothing wrong with being Welsh. Confession, I am Welsh, too. See, exactly. I'm not Welsh. Oh, oh right. So I'm. So I've just confessed to being the only Welsh person. Here. <laughs> Pretty much, you have. I mean, I'm. I'm an Oxford boy. So you oh, know, I'm yeah, I think probably I'd rather be Welsh. Of, of you anyway. <laughs> Even Danny from Cambridge. But there you go. Um, right. So we'll start the podcast this week uh, with Danny telling you all the results from Arsenal across the board. That's probably you. Morse code for someone to go fuck themselves and our luck. Um, yeah, <laughs> I didn't realise. How long is this? Uh, when, you know, we played Napoli in the Champions League. Our under-19s, under-18s, I think youth, whatever, they play the same team. Did you know about that? Yeah. Yes. Has it been going long? Because I was unaware of it. It's been going a couple of weeks. I, I mean, how many seasons has it been going? No, I think this is the first season. Oh, right. That's why I was unaware of it. I knew we were playing the other night. Um, we beat Napoli 4-1. And Akpom and Maureen Lippmann, they both scored two goals each. Um, so I think that's, they, that is a combination of the under-18s and the under-21 squads, I'd guess. I don't know. Because uh, it said Napoli under-19s. Now, we don't have an under-19 team. Anyway, so that's a fantastic result. Um, I don't know how good reserve and youth team football is in Italy. But um, I'd imagine that it's of a half-decent standard. So I do believe they have their own leagues over there. I think they take their youth football very, very seriously over there. Oh, good. Yeah, I'd hope they would do, and I'd have thought they would have done. Um, the under-18s, remember I said last week, if anyone goes to this game, you see a postman called Mick Dagger. Tell him I said Lowney owes me 12 quid for a Dreamcast game. Um, we drew 1-1 up at Bolton, and again, the Swedish wonder that is Jamal Rage scored. That's R-A-A-G-E. Um, hello, Lena, who's Swedish, if you're listening, and all our other Scandinavian listeners. And I was told that, I think, did they say that Greenland isn't in Scandinavia? When was that made law? I want that looked into. I'm going to get um, Boutros, Boutros Ghani to, to Google that for me. Um, their next game is on the 5th away at Aston Villa. Um, I don't know how good Villa's uh, under-18 team are, but hopefully we'll go there and spank them 9-0. Um, then the under-21s, we were playing last week. Um, we 
we played them uh, at their place because Fulham are top of the under-18 league and the under-21s league. We managed to get a nil-nil draw there, which is pretty good. So I'm quite chuffed with that. And our next game is at home to Wolves on the 7th. So that should be pretty good because if Wolves are dropping dropping like Gimli's pants after a taco lunch, I can't remember what you said you had to eat now. You're... Your seven shits in one day. I, oh no! It was KFC chicken wings. Oh, it destroyed me. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, yeah, they're they're uh, probably shit because if their own in their own main team were in the third division, they ain't going to be much better. And then the ladies won two nil. I think it was at Birmingham City at the weekend because Liverpool uh, ladies won the title for the first time in two hundred years. We finished third. And annoyingly, we had three points deducted for fielding an illegible player. So if we wouldn't have um, done that, then we would have finished second and we'd be in the Champions League. But we're not. So we're not. You know, it's not. So I think that's it now. We've just got a few more Champions League games to go. And uh, that's that's all of it, really. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, we've got two games to talk about this week in Swansea away and Napoli at home. Uh, so let's get cracking. Steve, I'd like to go straight over to you for your thoughts on the Swansea game, please. Well, it's never, it's never an easy place to go. And it was certainly, I think, a game where we know from last season that uh, we didn't have a happy time there on a couple of occasions. And they've got some players that can hurt you. But in the first half, we contained them. They sort of tried to get the ball of us. were running around sort of like the wolf huffing and puffing and trying to blow our house down and not getting very far with it. In the second half, we took it up a gear and... Uh, got the goals we needed and won the game, you know, and it was a great away performance, really. Again, Mr. Ramsey to the fore. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think one of the things that strikes true for me is that uh, in previous seasons, this is one of the games that, you know, we'd either draw or lose through a bad performance. And it seems to me like these games that we've gone, like with Stoke as well, that we're actually uh, winning them. Gav, this has got to be good. It's, you know, a, a nice start to the season, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done. I've, I sort of had a look at this earlier, and I thought, are we having a good start to the season, or are we just playing teams that generally would expect to beat? And if you look at the cor- corresponding fixtures from last year, we got 18 points out of the six games we played so far because we beat Villa at home. So all the games we played so far are all teams that we beat last year anyway. So you know, and I mean, I went down to Gunners on uh, Gunners Pub on Saturday with a few mates, and we had a good good drink up and everything so my recollection of the second half isn't going to be the greatest but it's just the point that you know we're all having a chat and blah 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 and I don't think really we're going to know where we stand until November really until we start playing the uh the Chelsea Man City Liverpool Man United that's when we're going to know whether or not we've actually improved at the moment we're we're making it look like we're beating these teams quite easy but there's still the intrepidation that really like I say in the six games corresponding fixtures last year, we got 18 points. This year, we got 15 points. So in reality, we're three points down on last year. Well, that's always a positive note from you, there. Um, well, Gareth. just like, um, well, you've got to tell it how it is, haven't you? Do you know what I mean, yeah. I mean, everyone's getting all happy and all overexcited. These are all games that you know we should be winning. They're all teams that we've played. Look, you know, Tottenham aside, are all going to finish in the bottom half, you know, middle to bottom half of the division. So these are the games that, you know, we've got to win. And we're winning them well, don't get me wrong. You know, we're playing well, we're, we're winning them well. But you know, these are the games we've got to win. You know, we haven't really, in the league, been tested yet. We played Tottenham at the right time as well. Uh, like I say, bring on November. Hopefully we have a few players back. And let's see what we really can do. Yeah. Uh, Jules, do you agree with Gavin what he's just said? Um, sort of. Um. I mean, I, I'm getting quite annoyed with people who say that, oh, we haven't played anyone hard. Where, you know, going to Swansea isn't an easy game. And we went there and made it look easy. Nappy at home isn't an easy game. I get, we made them look like mugs. So, I'm quietly optimistic. Um, but I, with a, a nice bit of caution, I think. Because um, we've seen how those across the road can... Uh, can fall by the wayside when they start talking themselves, talking themselves up. So, um, I, I mean, I think it was uh, a, a bit of a stale first half, but we just, I don't know, we just saw out the game and made it look very easy. Mm. And uh, one of the shining lights for that game would indeed be Serge Gnabry. Uh, Raj, what do you make of him as a player? 
he's looking good, isn't he, lads? I mean, um, what can you say? He's we, we've got a few players out who, who would normally play on that right right wing, and he's he's doing the job while they're they're away at the moment. Um, I think the team are playing well at the moment. Uh, I, I can see where Gav Gav's coming from, but um, we can't choose the fixtures. We have to play against whoever we're told to play against, and uh, we're doing the job at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm quite optimistic about this season, but there is a bit of caution there as well. So we'll have to see. I mean, I can't really talk more about these games at the moment. We're just winning them. Um, you know, the first half on Saturday, yeah, Swansea had a bit more of the ball than um, than us, but, you know, we took over in the second half and that five-minute spell in the second half won the game for us. So uh, let's hope they keep doing that. And Danny, uh, we'll go over to you. One of the players that you said needed to be stepped up or, or maybe even dropped um, in, in place of Arteta was Jack Wilshire. Do you think he stepped up for the Swansea game? Yeah, I think he was. He steps up forever. I don't like using that that phrase "step up" because it refers to baseball. I think he uh, he did his job. He's he's, he's uh, up for every single game. It's just his what he brings to the game. Now I'm still waiting for someone to give me a link because I know Opta do all this kind of stuff, but you have to be uh, some kind of member to be able to get Opta stats. I want to know second assists and who got them, and don't make me go through YouTube and watch all the games and work out who the second assist is, because I know, if, if you look at our, um, already this season, our, um, I did this little, uh, this in, infographic thing, because everyone else does really good ones, I spent five minutes with MS Paint doing it, and I looked like a three-year-old did it, <laughs> but in our run of, of 22 games, um, we've had 18 wins, three draws, one loss, in that time, how many goals do you think um, Wilshire has got? He's got you want to have a guess, or do you know? Two. None. Or one. one. No. None. How many, how many None. assists? None. Uh, two. Two. One. That's it. That's all he has got. So, out of 22 games, and people are getting, are saying, oh, you're moaning too much about him. No, he's just he's just not ready. He's not fully fit. He's not match fit. He, I don't think he knows what position he wants him to play in, because he started off playing a defensive midfield when he first started playing for us. Then he moved to the central midfield. Now he's got the number 10, which is which is the Bergkamp number, which would imply that he's going to play in that position. And I don't think anybody knows exactly what his proper position is, because Ramsey's come in and, and showed how the game can be played, just like um, playing in, like much like um, Sesk used to do, that kind of mm. central midfield goal scoring, setting up assists and stuff like that. And then we've shown that uh, Arteta's come in and now Flamini have come in and done the defensive role and... Wilshire can't do either of those two things. He's not scoring. He's, I mean, that's why I think he must be getting a lot of second assists, um, assists, because it's got to be something that he's doing. Because he's definitely not doing nothing. And he's running around. And I'm not down on the bloke at all. I think he's a fantastic player, and he just needs, like, like Jack, like um, uh, Ramsey last year, needed a year of just not really doing much, no pressure, to to come alive and and start doing it. But that but the thing, I want, the other thing I want to say was uh, Gav was on about this time last season. But if we actually get the first six games of last season, we had two wins, three draws and a loss. That was against us not comparing the same six teams that we played against. So I think, although points-wise against the same teams, if we'd have had to play them in the same order last season, we might have been doing better. I personally would rather have this fantastic start to the season and be top of the table because if someone's going to play Arsenal and we're top of the table or fifth or, fifth or sixth, like we're in some top point last season, weren't we in the bottom half at the beginning of the season? I believe so. Mm. Actually, here it is. I'm just looking. We were, 11... the, man, we were the man you last yeah. season. We were 11, 12, <laughs> 8, 3, 5, 8. That's the position we were in. So if people are going to play Arsenal last season, they're thinking Arsenal 8, 10th, 11th, 12th, no big problem. But if they're coming to play us now and we're top of the league by, what is it, one or two points? Something like that? Two points, we're top of the league. Yeah. yeah. They're going to be thinking, bloody hell, Arsenal are top of the league. We're going to have a little bit of fear in them. Mm. or they could be even more pumped up because they know they're playing the team that's at the top of the table so it swings and roundabouts I think it's very true so I mean it's whatever way you want to look at I mean did anyone else uh, stand out for you Gav? Uh, I mean I want to pick up on what you said and and what Raj said with uh, Gnabry I mean I thought he was absolutely superb Uh, he took his goal well and I I was really just really really pleased when he scored because he absolutely looked dejected when he missed the penalty against uh, West Brom and I think that's going to do him the power of the good, the fact that, you know, he's got on the score sheet. And he was just popping up everywhere, wasn't he? Do you know what I mean? And like I say, I mean, everybody else done done well, uh, from what I can recall. But like I say, I mean, I was just I was just pleased for him. I mean, he's 18. You know, he's there's 
you know, normally going to be two players in front of him for that for that position, and he's come in, you know, on literally no notice whatsoever, thinking he's going to sit on the subs bench and Theo goes off and he started at games, and you know, I just it's just really I just like seeing the younger kids coming through and when they get in a position where they can take a chance and when you know when they're getting the chance to perform just to take it and I thought against Swansea you know he's taking his opportunity well and good luck to the fella and Raj is there anything else you wanted to add to that no it's just what Danny said what we what we're doing at the moment forget about the quality of the opposition is we we get gaining momentum and uh it's going to lead us on well into the into the kind of the quite tough fixtures in November and December. So, don't worry about it too much. I think we're doing really well at the moment, and um, you know, the, the more points, the more wins they get now, the better it will be for us in the next couple of months. Hmm. And Steve, well, I think the, the emergence of Gnabry is a, is a great is a great sign because I think what it does is it gives Mr. Walcott some very needed competition when he comes back yeah, yeah. Um, fitness because Gnabry showed that uh, when he got his confidence and he wanted to run at defences, he, he was absolutely terrorising uh, Swansea. And he was, the only, he was the only one picking up, you know, the game at that point and running in. Whereas, you know, you, usually you'll get Mr. 100k a week past the Sanya and hide in midfield. That option's there, not there any longer because if Theo wants to go to the World Cup, which we all know he places more importance on his uh, England career than he does his Arsenal one... Um, then you know he's got he's got to come on and impress on the pitch because if he's not impressing in training, Gnabry's going to get his place. And I, I think you know Gibbs is showing uh, great form because he's got Nacho pushing him. Uh, you know, all over the park now, in nearly every position, we've got competition for places. People want to play. There's a good team spirit, and as Raj says, you know, momentum plus competition for places keeps you at the top of your game. And if we're at the top of our game, then we should be able to stay at the top of the table. No, I definitely agree with that. Um, and Jules, is there anything you want to add to this conversation? Well, I wanted to. I mean, I was looking at um, Ram, not Ramsey, um, Wil, Wilshire, and what Danny said, because um, Wilshire's kind of been pushed out to was it left or the right he was playing on? Um, left. I, was it left? Yeah, I remember that uh, there was um, Wenger said something about he likes to put central midfielders out on the on the wide oh. bit to give them less room to play um, and then he moves them back into the middle because it kind of like um, they get used to playing in like tight spaces um, mm. and, he's, and he kind of intimated that this was kind of one of the reasons why Ramsey's pushed on is because he was pushed out onto the left and he was um, kind of got used to playing in tight spaces put him back into the middle and now he's thriving so I was kind of thinking you know maybe that's what he's trying to do with um, with Jack push him out get him used to tight spaces and then bring him back in. But, oh, that's about it, really. Mm. Now, the, I mean, you, you've also got to add to this that uh, Oxley chamberlain is going to be coming back uh, in a few mm. months' time. And you've got him pushing you know, Gnabry and, well, Gnabry and Walcott for that position too. So I agree with Steve that competition is always good. We can see with the, uh, the, the step up of, Flappy, how good Chesney's been this season because I, I can't really fault him so far. Um, but I, I think the question that I wanted to ask, um, and I don't know which one of you wanted to take this, was how much of uh, the inclusion of Mesut Ozil has actually stepped up the morale of the team and how much of that signing has gone towards the team that we're seeing at the moment? I think I will go to Gav. Cheers. Uh, yeah, no, he's... I don't, I don't know what else Ozil could do, really. I mean, he's come in. He's, if you probably calculate how many actually training sessions he's had with a squad, it's still going to be a very, very low number, uh, with us playing twice a week. And he's just done brilliant. But you expect that of a world-class player. He's come in. He's, he's hit the ground running. He's had no problems fitting in. You know, we've had no stories in the press about him being, you know, unsettled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it just brings everybody up to another level because it's only you can only get you can only improve by playing with better players. Uh, I mean, like we all hold Ray Parlo, you know, with with fond admiration, uh, and that's due to the fact that he steps up because he was playing with you know the best players in the world at that time. Mm. Uh, and like I say, it's much the same much the same as what the current squad is. I mean, I think it's definitely improved uh, Ramsey. Uh, Flamini coming in has also been a very, very big factor on you know the brilliant performances we've had this year because uh, he's actually giving 
you know, the rest of the midfielders the opportunity to go dive forwards. He's covering at left back, he's covering at right back, uh, when Gibbs and uh Sagner are going on their forays forwards. Uh but yeah, I just think it just the you know, the overall thing of it really, uh he's just boosted everybody at a time when really we was possibly at our lowest. So, you know, it's a brilliant sign in and, you know, long may he continue. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I think he adds a lot to Arsenal's game. I mean, the guy's got incredible vision. He brings other players into the game. He's got such a fantastic first touch that half the time he's not even uh, not even stopping the ball. It's just one touch and move. He's got an a, a absolute amazing ability to wriggle out, wriggle out of tight situations and get himself space. 180 or 360 a player and get away from him but the other thing he's got is pinpoint delivery of the ball and he's put he's putting the ball exactly where Giroud wants it he's putting if you look we're scoring goals from corners and free kicks because the quality of the delivery is absolutely world class he can pick out Mertzacker at the near post he can pick out Giroud he can pick players out and he always seems to get himself in a position where he can make something happen or he can, he can put someone else in and you know, when you're playing with a player of that quality, of that magnanimity, you know, it, everybody's game steps up because they're prepared to make runs. They want to get on the end of that ball. They, they want to show him that they can deliver the goods. And, you know, that's what's lifting the team. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the big issue is we, we've got to keep him fit. But thankfully, he's got a great history, touch wood, of staying fit. Mm, definitely and he has come out today and said that Arsenal if they're going to be title contenders this year need to do actually step up their game uh, do you agree with him Raj? Oh, I, th- I think they are stepping up their game I think what, one, I mean we, we can all agree that uh, he's raised the levels of his teammates uh, but one thing that I've seen and I'm sure a lot of people will agree is that they're playing as a team now for the first time in a long time I mean they're playing as if they're enjoying playing with each other. They're mates. They're best mates. And sometimes if you're in a team scenario, that's the best way of doing things. Um, you know, in the, in the last couple of years, we've may, maybe had the odd player here and there who was a bit aloof from the others. But this season, it's been fantastic. They've, you know, it's, it's, they're just totally in with each other. It's, it's brilliant. And we'll finish this point off before we move on to the Napoli game with uh, you, Jules. Yeah, I mean, I... I... One thing I want to say is I don't think we should... I mean, it's easy to take this season in uh, on its own and say that uh, Mesut has kind of lifted us. But I think we need to remember that in 2013, our entire... You know, the whole, I mean, I think we have one of the best records in the league. So that, that kind of, like, team spirit has been there since the turn of the season. I mean, turn of the year. Um, but it's no doubt if you spend £42 million on who I think is probably the best player... Best midfielder in the world, shall I say. I remember seeing him against England under-21s, and he just destroyed them. So I think when you buy a player like that, it's you can't help but look at him and think, you know what, I, I need to raise my game, otherwise I'm just not going to get in the team. Definitely. Right, we'll move on quickly then, and we'll go on to the Napoli game. Um, and for his analysis, Danny. No. Is that... Is he eating again? Has he put it on mute because he's eating again? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm eating some cheddars. but I, I know you thing. so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that thing Jules just said about that 2013 set of results. I think we have, oh, I can't remember the, the stat either, but it was the, the best Yeah, the best um, run any team has had in a, in a calendar year, bar almost none in Premier League history. Now, people will probably be shouting at their... The wireless is going. That's not right. I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but that was that was the gist of what the the of the of the, the stat was. I just, I've just had a little, quick Google and I can't find it anywhere, so I've got no idea what it was. They, um, they, oh, go on. No, go on, Jules. I'll say they had it on match a day. Um, I, I even wrote it down because I showed it to my brother. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> it's I think it, they said it was the best um calendar year of any Premiership Premiership team since it started. Yeah, that sounds about right. I don't watch Match of the Day because it's so, fucking it, hard on it. No, I don't watch it. But I'm just, it kind of just reiterates my, my point that yeah. while it does, while Mesut does raise our game, we can't ignore the fact that, you know, I think it was since, um, was it Tottenham, Tottenham away? I think it was. Mm. Or, Tottenham are gay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a superb run. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, go on. So I keep updating my little, my infographic that looks like a three-year-old did it. Yeah, the, the Napoli game, I... I thought when I had us down as a 3-2 win 
and I thought it was going to be a very tight game because being I've been a fan of Inter Milan and Palermo for 25. 30 years something like that people may wonder why I support two Serie or I used to support two Serie A teams I supported Palermo since they were in like the Italian fifth division and it's not my fault they got promoted to Serie A but then got relegated again so yeah I've been a fan of Italian football for years and I knew with Rafa having his his previous of uh, playing playing a game and then shutting it all down once they get a lead if, I thought if they go 1-0 up then we're knackered because they've got um uh, right, Rainer in goal, who's brilliant, and then Hamsik this season in Serie A has got four goals in five games. But then, oh, pardon me. And then I read that um, Higuain wasn't even on the bench, and I thought, oh no, Mr. Hijuan Chicken. So, Hijuan. <laughs> so I, I quickly changed my first goal scorer to uh, someone other than Ozil. I thought, that's it, I'm fed up uh-huh. with having Ozil every uh-huh. single bloody game. Uh-huh. And the, the, Goggle-eyed shit never scores. <laughs> then I tweeted, Ozil scores. I didn't pick him. Ozil out. I've had enough. <laughs> but for us to get that first goal was just absolutely fantastic. I mean, so, it's so a moment of silence while we remember that goal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> didn't, I, yeah, it's just, I, I can see it down the right, bottom right-hand corner of my screen. Yeah, we can't have an entire uh, entire minute silence. Yeah, I can't. Just go, ah. Oh, oh, make oh, some sex noises. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. For Gimli's sake, oh. meh. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, that Shit, first goal. Shagging, big toe fucker. And I well, thought it was, okay. we were just going to go on, and I thought we can't beat Napoli, who this season in Serie A. I mean, Serie A is still a, a tough league to win. They've they played six games, won five, and drawn one. So they're doing fantastic in Serie A, and I thought if we can get a draw out of this, I'll be quite happy. But to get that first goal, and then so quickly to get the second goal, I thought we could be on for a bit of a romp here. Could end up being three, four, five nil. But then I think half time come a little bit too soon for us, so mm. that's that's why it didn't carry on going the way it was going. But I mean to say, I mean and I hate that saying when they go, "Would you have taken two nil before the game?" I'd have taken any result before the game because then I would have known what the result would have been. I'd have gone and put some money on it. So, but uh, yeah, that was a fantastic result, and I was delighted to see Ozil not only score a, a, fa- a fantastic goal, but get yet another assist. It's brilliant. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I had them down in our predictions league, which uh, Mr. Jeff Arsenal is still top of, and our guests mm-hmm. are doing very well too. Um, I, I had them down as 2-2 because I thought that although we were at home, Napoli are a very, very good team and um, honestly thought it was going to be a closer game. But I think first half, we actually embarrassed them. Um, what I want to know is, do we think that that's the best half of football we've played this season, Raj? Absolutely. This season, probably in the last 10 years. I mean, mm-hmm. Barcelona maybe in the last... Two years ago, came close to it, but I mean, I've not seen anything like it in the first half. That was absolutely fantastic. It was uh, orgasmic in some ways, but there you go. Um, no, I mean, I, I'm not going to go on about this game. We're just playing so well at the moment, and that was just brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Two new in the first half, then we, we killed the game in the second half. That's what, and that's what we should be doing. And our midfield strong, our defence is strong. You know, I, I can't give any more superlatives than that. Yeah. Is there anybody anything else that anybody wants to add to this before we move on? You know what? I was being quiet because nobody was actually fucking putting anything in the chat box. So I thought I'd just shut up because I thought it was Steve's turn or Jules <laughs> wanted to say something. But yeah, no, I mean, I agree. It was we played so well in the first half and we come out of the second half two new up and it was kind of like they didn't know whether to stick or twist, really. So we kind of just professionally played the game out. We kept the ball for long periods of time, which was good. Uh, it was good to hear the North Bank and the clock end doing their chance backwards and forwards, uh, which is good to hear again. Uh, but it, it was just a professional job. It was a superb first half. Second half, consolidated. We gave them no space. Obviously, they was missing their best player, uh, which which weren't great. But like I say, it was just nice to... It was just not. It was just nice. It was a nice see. It sounded a nice evening. I mean, for the first time in ages, sitting on my sofa, I actually wished I was there because it sounded lively. It sounded better than normal. I mean, obviously, the uh, the Napoli fans in the ground done their bit as well. But it it was just it was just nice. It was a professional job, especially second half. I was very pleased the fact that you know we didn't sort of bottle it and there was no defensive errors, which you know gave away a goal. Because at two one, we could have got a bit shaky. Uh, and like I said, it was just a job well well done. There was something mm. I, I was thinking about. I remember thinking during the game, yet again, Spain's number two left back 
Nacho, Monreal, come on on the, the 88th minute. And I think, what is the point in a substitution like that? We're at home cruising 2-0. So I thought it'd be nice to maybe get Gnabry on to, to get a game or stick Benter up, up front for 20 minutes. Give us everyone. They've, <laughs> everyone's oh, 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 they've let, you, they've let <laughs> us down, Danny. Well, he, I, he mentioned the B word, so I've got oh. to mention the C word. Oh, well, let the Danish it's Viking. The let, let, get the Danish Viking. Give him 20 minutes up front. Give Giroud a bit of a, a, bit of a rest. Because we only made two substitutions and one of those was in the 88th minute. I mean, for Marlon, he could have come on and... And 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 add a game and maybe give Jenkinson a bit of a, a roaming run down the right wing. So Miyachi as well. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't on the bench. Was he not? No. Oh. Yeah, so I'm just a little bit surprised that we only made two subs and one of those was with two minutes to go, which I thought was a bit more point, a bit pointless. Whenever I play football manager, and oh. remember, children, I took God Manchester Rovers Yawn. from, from up. tier ten. You to tell the up, everybody Danny. every week. We're fucking bored of it, Danny. No, you don't even know what I was going to say. Don't, don't grow I don't know what you were going to say. I left them to manage Arsenal. Oh, That's what I was going to yeah. say. Oh. Then I got sacked oh. after six Dan, months. Dan, Dan, You're Dan, such Dan, a sellout. No, Dan, but my point. Dan, let me. Football manager is like having your fucking it's name real. on the back of your shirt, it's mate. It's fucking it's real. fucking childish. Grow up, mate. Yeah, I'd like to see you do They named the stadium after me, for fuck's sake. That's how good I am. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> no, mate. but my point I was, was going to make relevant to that is always bring, make a substitution. Bring on the players. Give them a bit of a run. But to, to leave the rest of them on the bench, I thought was a little bit pointless. Would have been nice to uh, get the Viking up front. No, and Steve, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean... The, it was probably one of the most mesmerising performances I've seen by Arsenal in 25 minutes in the first half for about six or seven years. That They blew Napoli off the pitch. They completely bust Napoli's game plan, which was to come there and be sit back and try and hold the ball and try and hit us on the, on the break. Typical Benitez. And that early goal that went in, which was so cleverly uh, made and so wonderfully finished. I mean... He, he even had other forwards, ex-players like Alan Smith, saying, you know, how, how difficult that was to finish that goal. What a world-class finish it was. But it completely took the wind out of their sails. It completely ruined their game plan. And the pressure of the movement off the ball, the pace of the, the, the passing, that was that was Arsenal what it should be like. And that's, that's what we want to see on the pitch. And, you know, when you get a team that's functioning like that, knowing where each other are going to be, knowing where to put the ball, you know, when you've got Ozil in the middle conducting play like a metronome, practically, you don't want to, you don't want to make substitutions. You want to let the players enjoy it. You want, you want to let the players get used to it. You want to let it be, become natural to them to become a, a complete reaction. And if you back up that mesmerising performance by an absolutely stunning atmosphere in the Emirates, which was so loud, you know, traditional hybrid with a clock in, with a clock in, Highbury with the East End, Highbury going backwards and forwards, Napoli fans doing their bit, you know, constant, you know, we all follow the Arsenal. That place was like a cauldron, and it was like a cauldron because of the team's performance on the pitch, you know, conducted by a world-class player. But let's be fair, everybody who played in, 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 that, in that first and second half, up to the substitutions, played the best they played for a long time, and it was brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Definitely. definitely. And, and you guys touched about the atmosphere in the ground. This is one of the things that the BSM are trying to push, isn't it, Raj? Yeah, we are. I mean, we'll, we'll keep going on at it. But Tuesday was fantastic. The atmosphere, I mean, we, we had that great atmosphere at Spurs. I wonder now where, where the fans are now catching on. It's down to us now to create the atmosphere. I did mention this a couple of weeks ago on this podcast. And uh, maybe it's getting through to everyone in the ground that it's down to them to kind of start making that noise. It was it was brilliant. And I think while the team continue to play well, they'll carry on doing that. But hopefully if if and when we have a little dip that we'll you know we'll keep back in that team. We've got to do it. It's it's down to us. Yeah, definitely. And Jules, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Uh yeah, I mean obviously it was a great performance and uh, I don't want to keep going over that. But I just wanted to have a little mention for the for Flamini who uh did an outstanding job on Hamsick. Just didn't yeah. leave him alone all night. Just Always on his heels. Um, he kind of doesn't get enough praise, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, big up the Flamster. <laughs> Definitely, that was lovely. Per- um, and I think it was all positives all round. Um, we also sit top of our Champions League group. It's three points clear, isn't it? Am I right? Yeah, yeah one um, six. And that's a fantastic start. We've got Dortmund uh, coming to our place next. 
Um, and the news coming out today is that whether it's FIFA or whatever, I've given Klopp an extra game ban. So he'll be in the stands for the Arsenal match at the Emirates. I mean, how much do we think that will aid us as well, Danny? You shitbag, I was eating again. <laughs> You're just doing this on purpose when I go quiet. I asked on Twitter because I saw the um, someone did a, um, a Klopp thing of like Wolverine when he was uh, running up to that the, the fourth official and screaming at him and the, the fourth official shit his pants and took a few steps backwards. That was, I mean, I, I, I vaguely remember Klopp as a player. I, I remember the name more than the, because he used to have in, uh, um, what was that, hello, hello, you had, they used to come up to each other and go, Klopp. So that's what reminded me of him years ago. Um, but I asked, because he's now been banned for two games, like you were saying. And so he's going to, did you say he's going to, well, did we figure out that he's going to miss the home game for us? Yeah, I, I think, think that is going to be a massive loss for them. Because to have you have a touchline ban for your manager, unless he's going to manage to sneak in Mourinho style in some kind of laundry cart, then, I mean, I don't even know who their assistant manager is because he's such an, an imposing f- figure on the touchline and he does do it like to do a little bit of shouting. He doesn't sit there with his, his sketch pad and his, his pastels like Wenger does, making quaint drawings of what's going on. He gets out there and he Playing shouts. with a zip on his coat. <laughs> that's it. Squatting <laughs> down like he's fucking having shit problems. But he, he's, he's, that's why he's my choice as, as next Arsenal manager if, uh, if the great Arsene Wenger, which I think he will, wins the league this season. So much so that I was thinking of going to go and put 100 quid on it. That's and, how uh, confident I am. It, it looks um, even more positive about him being uh, Arsenal manager because I thought that in the past it's only Arsenal that get treated with extra little things like that when it happened to Wenger. Was it last year or the year before when he had a couple of match bans and then they added a couple mm. of... Uh-huh. fucking ridiculous, to be honest. But, but, but I mean, there you go. Points. Another thing, Danny, that we talked about earlier was that... Is it Wiedenfella? Yeah. Sent off against Napoli with a straight red card. I mean, does this mean he misses two or three games? You no, put out the tweet earlier. Yeah, nobody seems to know. There was a combination of it's a one game. So I think in the Premier League, it's three for a straight red. And in Europe, it's one or two. But someone said as he was outside the area, that's why he got sent off. It wasn't for a foul. So it's only a one game ban. So well, we, lo- we haven't got to the bottom of that. But the location on the pitch doesn't matter, really. Doesn't it? No. Uh, it's, just, it's just whether it's... Um, uh, two yellows or a straight red. That's the only difference. Oh, and it was a straight red he got sent off. We were, I, when we were discussing this earlier, I was looking on the FIFA page and it said they can, depending on the severity of the foul, they can make it more than one game or more than two games. I can't, I can't remember now what it said. But yeah, we're still not sure. But it'd be good if he is banned for three games because then he misses. He's missed the Marseille game. They had an Australian in goal. Could have been an, from someone from New Zealand because it was a very small picture of their national flag. And uh, then he'll miss because we, we've got back-to-back games with Dortmund coming up soon. And so it'd be great if they didn't have their goalkeeper for both and didn't have Klopp on the uh, touchline screaming at everyone for the first one. What does, yeah. their, what, what does their website say? Surely their website will tell you if he's suspended or not. Probably be in German. And I don't, my German is stuck to schnuzensfaden when you sneeze and I don't even think that's a word. Fuffsi fallen into kist. What the fuck does that mean? That means oh, I've fallen in some flour. <laughs> Uh, un beer bitter. One yeah, beer, please. there's a surprise. <laughs> there you go, Gav's, uh, Gav adds this bit. Right then, um, we'll end this bit, but I think one thing we need to touch on with wrapping up the Champions League segment is something that happened with a load of Napoli fans down at Pybury Corner. Um, Gav, I think you can shed a little bit more light and tell the, the good listeners of this show what happened. Yeah, no, I mean, I weren't there, but uh, like I said, I'm a good friend of, uh, of Paul's. Uh, and Nicky, who run Pirate Corner. Uh, just basically, it's just an unprovoked attack uh, by, depending on what report you want to read, anything between 30 and 100 Napoli fans uh, who decided to smash up their restaurant, uh, beat up their patrons, uh, and then do a runner. Uh, it's all very sad. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't sell all the Napoli supporters with the same brush, and obviously it's an isolated incident and something you don't want to hear reported, uh, especially when, you know, there was women and kids in there so I mean for them I feel sorry for the staff of Pirate Corn I feel sorry it's something that you know you don't want to see happen uh, especially in an establishment like that really uh, you know if someone wants to tear up then they should find people that are like minded enough to give them a tear up back not just attack innocent people that are just you know trying to have something to eat before they go to work uh, so I hope everybody joins me in wishing uh, everyone at Pirate Corner the uh, 
all the best for the future. Uh, I know they've they've reopened already after repairing all the uh, the damage. Uh, and like I say, that you know, let's hope these people get you know pulled and called up, and the Napoli police uh, give us some assistance because yeah, you know, it's it's just not cricket what what they did really. Uh, and like I say, I mean, if you were sitting in there with your ten year old or twelve year old daughter, you'd probably feel the same as what the poor people in there were were doing really. Mm. And Raj, there's something that the Napoli fans are doing, aren't there? Isn't there? Yeah, I saw on um, Highbury Corner's Facebook page. I mean, firstly, there's a. I mean, what happened the other night was a minority of Napoli fans, and uh, a lot of Napoli fans have been on that Facebook page and apologising for their behaviour um, and saying that you know, true Neapolitans don't act like that. But uh, a few of them are, are putting together a fundraiser to. Uh, try and raise the money to cover the you know the the damage so fair play to them and yeah, fair play. i know that there was uh an italian newspaper that phoned them up um giving their best as well so i think they've had quite a lot of um support from italy so i wouldn't necessarily you know condemn the napoli fans in general but as is with most situations with football violence it's just the minority that let the whole club down in in a way so um i I mean what i wanted to ask is should our fans be worried when they're going over there for for the return leg raj yeah they'll have to be careful i think they've they've got a reputation out there anyway um and from what what i've heard in the past uh, you just need to be careful out there and not try and attract the tensions of the wrong type of fan but um if you're careful, like you go into any foreign city these days, then you'll be fine. Yeah. So what we wanted to basically say was if you're going to the game, any game at the Emirates in the near future, stop in Pybury Corner, go and have a pie, you know, wish them all the best and uh, chuck some business their way. They're lovely, lovely people down there. And uh, we, we just really wanted to send them our best. Isn't that right, guys? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've got to ask for those who have been there, what's your favourite pie? Gluten free, and I think they've started doing gluten free as well. Steve, I've not been there yet. I had a, oh. I had a terrible tragedy. One of my mates uh, came over from Poland, went to went to watch an Arsenal game, and he brought me back a Pybury Corner pie, all the way back to Warsaw, put it in the fridge, and his wife gave it to his kids. Oh, oh. and it was to Tony Adams as well. Oh, gutted, Jules. Um, I can't remember. What it, it was a Tony Adams, but I can't remember what this. I can't remember what Steak and Al. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Raj? Yeah, Tony Adams again, but I, I do like their scotch eggs. They're lovely. Oh, it's a Charlie Nicholas for me. I'm going Bob, Dennis Burkamp for me. Oh. Chicken and leek. Oh. 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 There's, there's, there's just oh. been <laughs> way too many weird noises on this podcast <laughs> tonight. Yeah. First the Ozil goal and now the pies at Pivory Corner. Yeah, <laughs> we, I, I blame we... Jeff. <laughs> can we, yeah, absolutely. Can we stop the pie torture? Because pies are something that don't exist in Poland. What? What? But they they don't they don't have any sort of uh, tradition of making pies at all. And they don't understand the idea of putting savoury things inside uh, pastry. Until, uh, uh, until of course you cook one and then they steal all of it. <laughs> they, don't, they don't do carp pies, Steve. They don't do what? They don't put carp in a pie or anything. No. No, but the, 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 the pastry is something reserved only for uh, uh, sweets and desserts. Wow. wow. That's, that's, a, that's a fucked up country. Hello to all of our Polish listeners. <laughs> Just <laughs> discover the same pie. Pies. It is the future. I um, think all, all Polish Arsenal fans, when they go to Arsenal, should go to Pybra Corner and get a proper education in pies because that's the best place to go and get one. Definitely. And if you mention the podcast, you get a 0% discount every time, <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> if you mention the podcast, you'd probably get laughed at. <laughs> right. we'll, we'll, we should talk about the rumours uh, this week that Arsenal are about to offer Arsene Wenger a new contract that I believe is worth £8 million a year. Gav, I know this is one close to your heart, so would you like to kick us off? Yeah, uh, I just don't see why, really. Uh like Sam, as I mentioned earlier, our, our results so far in corresponding fixtures from last season you know, are, are slightly worse than what they were. And yes, it was a great result against Napoli. Yes, we're playing well. You know, yes, we're brushing teams aside uh, with the you know, more ease than we did last year. Uh, and yes, we're on a great run. I appreciate that. And I appreciate how great Wenger is. And I appreciate that you know, Wenger's Jeff's best mate and all that. But, you know, 
we haven't won anything, and we haven't won anything for a long time. Uh, you know, he's bought in Özil. He could have bought in another two players at a similar amount of money on a similar amount of wages, and we still could have balanced the books. So, you know, he's still underspent. You know, we've still only got one striker because you can't include that cunt from fucking Denmark. But the, uh, you know, it's just the wrong time to even be talking about a contract. And the only time they're talking, the only reason they're talking about a contract at the moment is, you know, it's a good time to bring up that news. It's a good time to bring up that story because we're doing well at the moment. You know, it, it, it's just not right. You know, so, you know, Wenger's always said for the last three, four, five years, judge me in May. So, you know, I would turn the favour back to Wenger. Yes, we'll judge you in May. If you have a good season, then you should be rewarded with a new contract. If you don't have a good season, then I'm sorry, mate. You know, let's get someone else in and give them a shot. Mm. I mean, any other club in the world at the top of its league or game... Would they let their manager go eight years without a trophy and reward him, not sack him? I mean, Jules, what's your take on it? Well, I, I've i got no problem with him getting a new contract. I I have a problem with three years. That's what I have a problem with. Because um, his contract runs out um, next summer, right? Is it next summer? In, uh, in That's the, end of, it's the end of this season, it runs yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, so it, it's... So I don't want to get into a position where we get to the end of the season and we've got, a, you know, a manager who's, whose contract's already run out and then we get all of that bollocks during the summer. I don't want to go through all any of that shit again. Um, so I've been, I'm very happy to, like, give him a one-year contract. Say, so, look, we'll give you one year uh, extra um, and then we'll see where we go from there. But three years? I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not up with that. I'm with Gav. Okay. Yay. <laughs> and Raj, do you think he should be rewarded with a new contract? Yeah, possibly, but not. It's, this is the wrong time to be discussing contracts. I think it's just the pre-AGM PR marketing stunt or whatever. I mean, we've got a lot more important things to think about. We've got some big fixtures coming up over the next six to eight weeks. City, Man United, Chelsea, plus a whole load of Premier League games, plus Champions League games, plus another Carling Cup or whatever you call it game. I mean, why are we talking about contracts now? Um, I mean, Arsene Wenger said himself, in the media a couple of weeks ago that, you know, he'll, he'll make that decision at the end of the season. So let's stick, you know, stick with that uh, and, and assess his position in May. Um, but there's no point doing it now. Mm. And this is quite a controversial topic. And judging with just having signed Ozil and the results that we've had for the last 10, 15 games, this as a business a business idea is the right thing to do, isn't it, Steve? Mm, absolutely not. Um, no normal company would allow their chief executive to underperform and keep 70 million quid in the budget and not spend it for five years uh, without having severe words. You know, he's gone and bought Ozil. Ozil was given assurances about Wenger staying. He's had the backing of the owner of the club, Stan Kronka. The board have indicated they're willing to sit down and negotiate a new contract with him. And as Raj rightfully said, Wenger himself said, now's not the time for this. I'll do it at the end of the summer. I, I always see my contracts out. I think we need to concentrate on what's going on on the pitch at the moment. The games are coming up. And he also needs to concentrate on the January transfer window. Because in the January transfer window, if we can get there with everybody fit. And we can go and spend a lot of money again and pull in that top striker we need and possibly fill another few little holes in the squad. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about a year of absolute glory where we could possibly not just win one thing, maybe more than one thing. And uh, I'm sure that's what Wenger wants. I'm sure that's what the board want. And I just don't see there's a need for, uh, to enter those discussions at the moment. I don't see there's a, there's an urgent burgeoning need to start those negotiations at all at the moment. There's more of a need to get our scouting uh, operation sorted out. There's more of a need to make sure that when we're talking to agents, they're not bullshitting us so we don't have another Suarez Farago. And, to, you know, to get targets identified for the January window from non-cup tied for the Champions League strikers and, and make sure we're ready to go out there and use this money we've got in the bank because we've still got 150 million quid odd spare we could spend in the bank. And I think it's about performing on the pitch. I think it's before, about performing in the transfer window. And if we get that, and if we get to the end of the season where he wants to discuss it, 
and he's done well and the team are, are, are playing like they are at the moment, then I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be um, renegotiated. But I don't see why he should get a million pound a year wage, wage increase. He's getting seven million pound a year now. Is that not enough? I mean, we are in the middle of austerity. Some Arsenal fans are losing their jobs. Arsenal fans are getting priced out of the game. Uh, you know, Arsenal Wenger is probably one of the highest, if not the highest paid manager in the Premier League. I don't see he needs to get a million pound a year rise. Mm. Danny, you're normally someone that will come up with uh, some some phrase or little witty ditty. So can we have one from you quickly? A witty ditty. Um, yeah, I was reading that bit by our very own um, John Cross, his mirror. I was reading about that and just gone and found the article again. And that he's on a £500,000 a year pay rise now. I don't know about any of you, but are any of you on a £500,000 a year pay rise? Please. Please. <laughs> For doing, not doing your job. Now, I'd say, like, like Jules was saying to everyone else, yep, give him a one-year deal. I know that PSG are sniffing around. And I know Gav's point is very true that the fact when you take into account the, the money we've saved on, on wages, the money we've made from transfers, the money we got from the Premier League, he's in effect have spent nothing. But we'll wait in January and see to that. And I think it's just amazing. I, does, do any of us know how we've managed to do what we've done already this season? So got rid of a load of deadwoods, spent a little bit of money, and we're running away with the league. And the, the mirror bit also says that Jose Mourinho is on £12 million a year. Fucking hell. Just think if we were paying £12 million and doing what Chelsea are doing. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So, Gav, if Arsenal are still top of the league at Christmas and we've bought a world-class striker, would you give him a contract then? No. And why not? No, it, it, like I say, it's got to the point now, really, where it's it's a, it's a shit-or-bust season for, for uh, Wenger. Either we're going to win something... And then he deserves some kind of new contract or we don't win anything and he deserves to be turfed out. I think it really is he's come to that black and white when it comes to a lot of supporters. Uh, obviously, the, the board and our majority shareholder are, are bang behind him uh, and they're never going to want him to leave purely on the fact that you know, there's no other football men on the board. But, I mean, obviously, that's a, a separate issue that I know Steve and, and Roger spoke about previous. Uh, but, yeah, no, it, it's just it's just completely just completely wrong to bring it up at this time at the moment and if he does get any kind of extension uh firstly i'd like to see him on less wages uh, but getting a bonus if he actually wins something uh, i mean if if i do well at work i get a bonus you know a lot of people who are in performance related jobs you know, get bonuses but you know yeah you know, he's not and i mean i would prefer to see him like that obviously but you know, even if he does do well this year, really, at the age he's in, we should be giving him like a one-year rolling deal. OK. Uh, Raj, what have you got to say about this? I just think I think he's, he's a very, very honourable person. And I would think that he'll stick to what he said a couple of weeks ago. And hopefully he'll just come out and just say, look, we've got more, more important things to worry about. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision at the end of the season. I'll trust him on that. So we'll end this segment then by simple question, and I'll get each and every one of you to answer it. Does he deserve a new contract at the moment? I mean, this moment in time. Danny? Um, after we've done this, I just want to do a little bit on the stats that Gav's brought up. Um, one year, yes. Gav? At the moment, no. Steve? Not until the end of the summer, and then we'll see what's, what's been achieved. Raj? Judge him in May. And finally, Jules. Uh, if it's a one year, yeah. Otherwise, no. Fantastic. Danny? Yeah. Um, Gavers on about the stuff. I've been just doing the, the stats on the beginning of the season. This, If you take all f- um, six games we've played this season and the same six games last season, home and away, we'd have had 16 points last season and 15 points this season. And the only difference is... This year we won away at Stoke 3-1 and we drew 0-0 there last year. And this season we lost 3-1 at home to Villa and last season we beat them 2-1. Other than that, all the results are the same. I just wanted to clear that point up. So, And that Villa game was, it was either going to be 2-2 or 3-1 because he went all out to get that a goal and that's why we lost that game. So I think you've been a little bit harsh on him there, Mr Gav. I think he deserves it. Fair enough. <laughs> See, Stra, he just comes in one sentence, you've been done. You owe me money before he starts getting smashed up. You slag. 
<laughs> Moving on, and our next segment for this podcast sees us focus on the team itself. We asked on Twitter for questions this week, and by far and away the most popular was what our starting eleven would be when the whole squad is fit. So which one of you wants to start me off on this one? Steve. Steve. On my, on my best team if everybody was fit? Yeah. It's not an easy question, this, is it, really? Um, I will go with... Oh, Wojciech- oh, right. Steve, Steve. There's only there's only one question. It's what what our midfield is going to be. We know what the defender is going to be. We know mm. it's going to be Giroud up front, up front. I think we've got to discuss what the five midfield is going to be. Surely. Okay. Yeah, I, th- I think it does, and I think I think it brings us back to this Jack Wilshere conundrum that we were talking about earlier yeah. on. Mm. Um, I'll say my choice for team first, and then I'll say what I think about Jack. But uh, obviously, Shensny in goal, Sagna, uh, Sanya, Murtasaka, Koz. And Gibbs at the back, with for me Ramsey and Flamini playing in front of them, uh, with Walcott and Kazula and Ozil playing in front of them, and Giro up front, and I think that gives you great platform, strength in defence, robust defender of defence, uh, defence in the, in front of them with Flamini. It gives Ramsey a license to roam forward. You've got pace on one wing with Walcott with Sanya overlapping. You've got Kazula's ingenuity playing directly uh, with Ozil. And the, it allows people to, to, to move around the pitch and get forward and get up front and support Giroud. Uh, and I think those people putting the ball in to the box, Walcott, Kazula and Ozil, are, are going to score us a lot of goals. But to come back to Jack, I think it's very clear that, first of all, there's an issue of where Jack Wilshire should play. And I don't think even perhaps Jack Wilshere knows where ideally he thinks he's his best player. But I think that's rather irrelevant subject at the moment because it's very clear that he's not fit. It's very clear also he's recovering from an injury and he's got issues with that physically, stamina-wise and mentally. And I think he needs to now have the luxury, which of course he's got, because by buying Ozil, Jack doesn't need to play in the middle of the park. When we get Kazula back fit, he doesn't need to play on the left. And if Walcott and the Ox come back and competing for places, Jack can play bit parts. He can come on uh, during games, 10, 20 minutes to go, play, get his confidence back, get his mind sorted out, get get fit, get rested, not continually get picked for England and get kicked off the pitch. And he can get himself back to the player he was before his injury. And then when he's in training, then the opportunity is going to present itself for him to play and they'll be able to find his best position. But for me, at the moment, I don't think Jack Wilshere should be playing if others are fit. Hello? (laughs) (laughs) Shall I take over? It's all gone very quiet. Who isn't there? Now we're all here. Gimli? Gimli's gone. (laughs) Anyway, over to Gav. (laughs) Sorry, Uh... but... My microphone switched itself off. I don't oh, know why. Were you, were you eating cheesy biscuits? <laughs> okay, well, we'll start that then. I'll give, give five seconds of silence. Uh, yeah. No, I'll leave it in. Yeah. And Gav, what's your start in 11? Exactly the same as Steve. I agree with every word he says. Uh, let's move on. Well, you've, you've, you've made this easy. I mean, one of the things, and I'll, I'll go to Jules and Raj in a bit, but is... Thomas Vermaelen is the captain of our great football team. Yeah, I don't think any of you would probably have him in your back four at this very moment in time. Now, should Arsene Wenger be thinking about stripping him of the captaincy and giving it to somebody who's guaranteed a first team 11 slot every week? Or should we keep sticking with Vermaelen? I mean, Raj, no, what's your sure. take on that one? He's been given the captaincy, he keeps it. I mean, at the moment, we're picking a team based on form, aren't we? Uh, there's a few players out on injury, and they're going to have to wait until they, they can get back into the team. I mean, I've got the same team as uh, what Steve said. Uh, the only reason, slightly different reason, is that I put Theo in purely because of his pace, but not not really on his form in some ways. So um, he gets that pick. But, you know, if Theo doesn't perform very well, then, you know, you, you, you've got Rosicki. And we're going to try and fit in Jack. But Steve's right. Jack's got to have a few weeks off. He just needs to recover from his injuries. OK. And Jules, then, we'll take your start in 11, please. Uh, yeah, exactly the same. Um, obviously, uh, the question, I, apart from Jack, is uh, obviously Flamini or Arteta. Um, 
I think there's a good argument about which one should deserve that starting place. Um, I think Arteta's done more over the last couple of seasons, but Flamini's in good form. Um, but as for Milan, um, I don't see the point of having a captain who's not even in the team. I just, I just don't see the point of that. Um, personally, I'll just take it off him and give it to someone else. I think we're in a good position at the moment with the uh, like the team that we've been playing recently. That we've got a few people that are willing to sort of take that role on anyway. Uh, Flamini seems a uh, he's come back really as a sort of a natural leader on the pitch, and you can see him pointing and pushing and filling in and kicking people in the appropriate places, which is nice. Uh, so, like I say, I mean, you know, my choice really would be. I know he's only just come back, but. Flamini is a very, very good leader on the pitch, as is uh, Mertesacker. So, you know, I'm not one for the fact that a captain can actually influence the actual performance of the team too much. I think no. a captain's role these days is more off the pitch, making sure that the young players are OK, making sure that the new players are fitting in, etc., etc., making sure everyone's comfortable. But to me, really, I mean, you've got to have, for one of a very fucking cheesy expression, is you've got to have a team of captains. And at the moment, and well, at the moment, we've got two or three that really, really would fit that role. And I think the problem we've had in the last four or five years is we've had nobody on the pitch who's been sort of captain material. And now we've got, you know, I mean, Sagna's playing blind at the moment, leading by example. Mertesacker's <coughs> doing well. Flamini's doing well. Ramsey's got to be a shout for a future, you know, future captain. And, you know, like I say, it's... It's a tricky situation, but like I say, I just think the actual role of captain on the pitch sometimes is a little bit overrated. I think really you know, you want a team full of sort of leaders and winners is more important than just one strong captain. Mm. I agree with that 100%. We've got uh, very good players, at least two in each position uh, on the pitch. I mean, competition is always going to breed success. Um one question that I got asked by one of my followers this week that was going to go in the podcast, but I'll just chuck it in quickly now. And I, I apologize to him because I can't remember who it was that actually asked me. But he said about Oxley chamberlain coming back and would he actually struggle to get into the starting eleven at this moment in time? And would it be best to maybe send him out on a half-season loan somewhere? I, uh, Jules, would you would you agree with that? I don't know about sending him out on the loan. Um, I'm not too sure what that would achieve. I mean, <laughs> I don't think he gets into the team at any, at any pace. He's just, uh, he needs, he's one of those people who needs to step up his game. Um, he's only he, young though. He's only yeah, young but, still, he, but so is Ramsey. He needs to look at Ramsey and say, and look at how Ramsey's kicked on this season. And he needs to look at that and say, I need to be doing that. Because if I don't do that, um, you know, Nabry now is coming on. I think actually Nabry is progressing better than Oxlade Chamberlain, which is a bit weird because I really expected the Ox to be kind of up there by now. Um, so no, he doesn't. He doesn't even get in my squad if everyone's fit. But surely to push on, you need game time. And if if Arsene Wenger isn't going to give him the game time, how do you how do you expect him to push on, Raj? He'll, he'll get the game time. We've got 50-odd games this season, so everyone's going to get a few games. Don't worry about that. I wouldn't send him on loan whatsoever. I think the brilliant position that we're in at the moment is that there's competition for places in each and every single position. And uh, the most important thing is that um, there seems to be a slight ruthlessness with um, Arsene Wenger. Danny mentioned earlier on about him not bringing on his regular three uh, substitutions the other day. It's maybe because he just wants to kill these games now and he doesn't need to bring these subs on. You've got to have to fight for your place. You know, it's a shame that Artes is not in the team at the moment. He's a very good player, but he's been out injured and he needs to just fight for his place now. It's fantastic. It's good for the club. I don't know. And you... Oh, go on. Go on, Danny. Oh, I was going to say, off the top of your head, is it you, everyone just like me where you think Flamini joined us in 2004, went off to Italy for a few years, come back. You automatically assume that Flamini is older than Arteta, don't you? But he's not. Yeah. He's almost exactly. Two, yeah, he's two years younger than Arteta, and he mm. is a proper defensive midfielder. And I made this point in a, a podcast a while ago. I would pick Flamini in defensive midfield over Arteta all day long for one reason only. In our Champions League run, Flamini filled in at left back. He's filled in at right back. He could probably even do a job at centre back, and he's a defensive-minded player. You try imagine Arteta filling in at left back if Gibbs has made a run. 
who would you want to cover the left back for Gibbs, right back for Sagna, if they've made a run up front? I know who I'd rather have, and it wouldn't be Arteta. He's done a brilliant job, but he's not a defence-minded player, although he has been fantastic for us. So my starting team, Flamini, would be one of my first picks straight away. He's been, for me, with Chesney's recent displays, my two um, players of the season, apart from the obvious Ramsey. Steve, would you agree with that on Flamini? Yeah, I think he made a big difference. You saw what happened. He came on in the in the in, in the derby. First thing he did was kick Danny Rose six foot up in the air. <laughs> Got in the middle of the park, started positioning people, barking out orders, geeing people up. He brings a lot to the team. He's an organizer. He's a general, and he's a player that plays in that position naturally. And as Danny says, you know, he, he's got flexibility. He can play elsewhere on the pitch. But what else he brings to our game? that uh, Arteta doesn't, is he always recovers, he always gets back to the middle, and he doesn't slow the game up. And that was very noticeable when we played against uh, Napoli. The, yeah, no, I mean, at the cool. back, you, you had Rosicki, you had Ramsey, and you had you know, Flamini sat slightly behind them. That gave such a plank that it gave everybody the license to roam forward and get all over the place because they knew that he was going to get back there. They knew that if anybody got anywhere near him, he'd either rip the ball off or rip them up. And, you know, he keeps the pace of the game going. He just he just collects the ball and gives it off to someone else. You know, he, and, then, and then he goes back to where he's supposed to be and organises the pit behind him. And Arteta is a great player, but he, he does slow our game down, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Arteta's really... I mean, I don't think he's a naturally uh, sort of defensive midfield player. I mean, he, he never played in that role for Everton. And I think he, he was kind of pushed into that role for us. But, I mean, what you know, to, to back up what Steve said, I mean, one of the things that I like about Flamini is the fact that when he does give a foul away, nine times out of ten, he, you know, it's around about the, uh, the halfway line. You know, he's, you know, whereas Arteta, you know, he was sort of like run with a player and then sort of, take him out just outside our box. So the actual free kicks that Flamini's given away at the moment, he's given away in areas of the pitch which aren't dangerous, uh, which is, again, helping the defence and helping, you know, a lack of you know, free kicks and, you know, dangerous free kicks against us. So I, he's just got that intelligence, and I think that's come out of <clears throat> playing in Italy. Uh, look, you know when, you, you know, you've only got two defenders behind you and they're breaking, you know, take him out by the halfway line, you know, take, you know, take the yellow card, you know, do, do the, uh, do the easy foul, but do it early. And I think that's his experience. And that's the experience that we're missing. And the role that Arteta could never actually do for us. And being 29, he could do that job for the next four or five years. He yeah. is, easy. he is filling the role, the hole that Gilberto left. Mm. That's what we've been crying out for. We've been on about Frimpong coming in there, who, who was just—he's not—he he wasn't even injured, was he? And he wasn't even a sub. Frimpong's out of the club, unfortunately. So I thought I had, I had um, high hopes for that bloke. But for me, I was saying earlier that what has been the difference? Because essentially, this is the same team we had last year. What has been the difference to make us the team we are now? And could it be Flamini? Yeah, yeah. Well, it yeah. and it was free I, I transfer. Think, Genius. Fl- fl- Flamini's been. Every much so far as successful as Ozil. Didn't he at once? I remember someone saying, and I must have missed it. Didn't there was a, a tackle and he pushed Ramsey out the way so he could go in hard yeah. on someone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Puts, literally, Ramsey was uh, almost strolling, and uh, Flamini just pushed him out of the way and did a sliding tackle and gave Jeez. away the foul. <laughs> that is that is a thing it's, of beauty. I, I do agree, though. It is Flamini that is helping this team. But I think you've also got to take into consideration that Giroud looks twice the player that he was last season. And to to coin an Arsene Wenger phrase... Um, like a new signing. A- a- Aaron Ramsey does look like a new signing. I mean, confidence is sky high. They're going and beating people... I mean, playing teams off the pitch. I mean, when Arsenal, and I know you hate the term step it up a gear, Danny, but when they really want to step it up a gear, my God, they, they look like they're, they're capable of beating pretty much any team in the world. I think a very good time to be an Arsenal fan at this moment, I oh, think. I just think of it. It's step up to the plate I don't like because it's a baseball term and we don't play baseball in this country. You don't want to get stuck behind the eight ball. <laughs> but I was just thinking, because all of us are old enough to remember Arsenal at their greatest and you think eight years all these poor young 15, 16 year olds that are all supporting Arsenal. They don't know why. Imagine this 
tenfold. That's what it was like to be an Arsenal fan 2004 and before. In the in the first half of, uh, of Wenger's tenure, that's what it was like all the time. No one would fuck with us. We won everything. We were cup finals year after. It got boring. I knew I could set the car on auto cruise to get down to Cardiff. That's how fucking regular we were. And this is what it's like to be an Arsenal fan. And I can see these days coming back. Man United are a spent force. Liverpool will fuck up. And uh, them lot, oh, I can't say the Y word, can I? Um, Spurs, they will uh, they'll end up doing something fucking stupid, going and spending £200 million buying bail back or something. That's awfully positive for you. About two months ago, you were ready to slit your wrist mid-summer. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it's partly because of the, the transformation. And I mean, plus you've got the added thing of, as a defender, you're going to be shitting your pants when you've got a... Um, uh, Almunia coming out, flapping around. You'd be thinking, geez, I, I've got to defend and I've got to make sure the ball doesn't go anywhere near him. And the saves that Chesney is pull, pulling off has got to give the defender so much confidence to not only get forward a little bit, but to play a more free game. Because they he's shown that the Swansea game, some of the saves he made of that game were absolutely outstanding. So that is and like another player who has just come on leaps and bounds. Ramsey, Giroud and Chesney this season are like new players. Mm. I mean, I don't know what it seemed like to you guys, but every time a ball got crossed in the area, just Chesney just rode against everybody else, just plucked the ball from the air, and it's like safe hands. Back to the back to the days of uh, David Seaman, I think. It's just what a fantastic keeper he's turning out to be. And what do you guys think when he was dropped for the last couple of games of the season last year? Do you think that's come into consideration with his form? Who are you asking that to? To anyone who wants to answer oh, it. They're all busy writing stuff. So well, no, I mean, they're all slagging off each other in Polish <laughs> think... in the chat box. <laughs> yeah, like like any of them are getting it right. Um, I, I think the problem with Wojciech Szczesny is, is he, he admitted himself he, he did suffer from motivation to compete in games that he didn't consider to be uh, top games. And I think him being dropped and having... Fabianski fit and obviously this Viviano coming in you know he's got some real competition now I think it's just a shame we don't have a great goalkeeping coach to really push all three of them on so we could have three great keepers but yeah you know he's he's coming in the back he's cutting out crosses he's he's making he's making uh, match winning saves and I think this is what people forget you know about keepers keepers can win your game a good keeper can get you 15 points a season you know Schmeichel regularly made a contribution of that order to, to, to United's greater teams before uh, their party was uh, starting to filter out the kitchen. Szczesny's now seems to be motivated. I think there's no coincidence in the fact that this is since Viviano has come to the club. He, he's playing even better than he was at the end of last season. And Jules, we'll move on to you now. Yeah, I just wanted to speak very briefly about the, um, the new keeper because I've um, I've heard... So- so many people saying, oh, we need to buy a new keeper, need to buy a new keeper. But, you know, Vi- uh, Viviano is like number two for Italy. Um, it's only Buffon that's keeping him out of the team. And, uh, you know, they, they're never going to drop Buffon until he retires. So, you know, he's kind of unlucky in that regard. But it's obvious that it's pushed Chesney. You know, he's seen this keeper come in and he's got Fabianski behind him. You know, and I, I, I mean, I've seen that, this, um, that Viviano play. Uh, and he's very, very good. He's a massive guy, but he's really good. And I think if Chesney starts screwing up, I think he'll go straight into the team. And I think that's pushed um, pushed him on. But what about Flappy? Because he got played against West Brom, and I honestly would have thought, was it £1 million they paid for um, the loan? Was it Danny on Viviano? Yeah, it's usually roughly yeah. that kind of Yeah, price. I was a little confused by that. I thought Viviano would play in that. but Yeah, yeah I was... I was that kind of confused me. I don't, I don't get what Arsene Wenger's game plan was there. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's a reason behind everything. Raj, is there anything you wanted to add to this? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> have, anybody, have you heard of the, the, <laughs> the cancer? Fuckers with the chat box again. <laughs> no, no, I've got goalkeepers. I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, Chesney's our best goalkeeper, probably. I've got no idea why we bought Viviano, but I would imagine it's because perhaps. They don't really trust Fabianski as much. Uh, but I've got no interest in this subject whatsoever. So uh, you can leave me out of this one. I like, I like drummers in bands. You just, they're in the background, you know, just hopefully they'll... Oh, I know you it. have interest in this topic, Steve. So let's go to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
at the end of uh, last last season, sort of like about three months before, Fabianski was told by the club that he should look for a new club, that he wasn't going to uh, be number one. And uh, he then got injured, so he couldn't sell him. And he's basically been told by the Polish manager that if he wants to be considered for the squad for the Polish national team, then he has to be playing regularly at a reasonable standard club. If Viviano works out as a loan, there is an option to buy there. Um, I, I think it's very likely, given that Fabianski's contract doesn't have too long to run, that he possibly will move in the summer. And, it, you know, he has to do that because he's a little bit older than Szczesny. He uh, has got two or three other keepers in, you know, competing for the, the Polish jersey. I mean, Szczesny's not guaranteed to get the Polish jersey at the moment because Boric has got it. But, you know, Fab, Fabianski, if he's not playing regularly, he's not going to play for Poland. And I think, basically, that will mean he will move in the summer. Fantastic. I think we'll draw a line under that then and we'll move on to some predictions. And the next game we have coming up is West Brom away in the Premier League. So, Danny, as we always start with you, we'll start with you. Well, start. I'm looking at the absolute, the, the dire game. Absol, that's not even a word, doesn't he? Doesn't he? That Belgian player. Um, the, 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 the way, you. yeah, thank you. The way um, we played away at West Brom before um, showed that those players aren't quite good enough because uh, you think we're going to need. We've got a lot of games coming up. Um, West Brom are shit. Um, they've only got one decent player. Um, well, they did beat Manchester United last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I think that, was fun, uh, that, that I watched that game, and that was I. For the life of me, I have no idea how or why they managed to beat West Brom. I mean, beat Man United. That was one of the most brilliant results I've because seen. Because Man so United are just pure and utter shite. Rio Ferdinand is about five yards off the pace. Vidic looks scared about going into any tackle. Can, because uh, can he... we can we edit oh. this out? We don't want all this vermin talk on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and the cut's uh, done. Still a cut's done. Obviously, Danny's a closet manure fan on the quiet. <laughs> yeah. need, needs banning for a week as host for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Button monkey, not host. Um, my, my point is, West Brom are shit. No, I know I wasn't the one who said they're good. They're shit. We're going to go there. And we're going to beat them four 0 and I think it's going to be um, I don't know Giroud to get the first goal. I'll probably change this midweek like I usually do and put down a seven nil loss. But that's my my estimation now is a four nil win. Giroud first goal. Okie dokie, and we'll go to Gav. I'm going for three one and Giroud. And Steve. I'm going to go for uh, 3-1, but I think um, Ozil will score. And Jules? Uh, 3-0 and Ramsey. And Raj? 4-0, I reckon, and uh, I think Ozil will score the first goal. And you, Gimby? I'm going for 2-0 Ozil, first scorer. That means that won't happen. Which uh, which get which, which guess Yeah, that's fucking bound to happen. Don't put your money on that, everyone. Uh, who which get which guess score prediction are we gonna are we gonna take? Probably best to do Jules is because uh, well actually we can whichever one doesn't win so then they don't go yeah, above you yeah. in the points table. Right. <laughs> uh, Danny, Danny, I'm, I might want to ask you where do you happen to be in the predictions league? Sorry, I can't hear you. Speak up. Is it Hello? Uh, you, uh, Houston? Sorry, yeah. move on. Can't hear you. Is it is it where you like to be bottom? Well, let's just, just we're, that's out of seven. I'm <laughs> bottom out of seven. Let's talk about the fantasy football. We're out of eighteen hundred people. I'm forty second. Where are you, Gimli, with your Suarez up front? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I've, I've already told you about this. Uh, that yeah. I haven't been into it. I uh, haven't uh, even uh, checked uh, it. Well, I'm going to go into it at some point within the next yeah, week. I'm going to change up. all my team around, and yeah. then the rest of you are fucked. Really. Yeah, I don't believe right. that. I don't believe that for a second. Let's have a look. I'm just looking at your team now. Out of 1,800 people, you're 1,797. <laughs> and on top of that, you've got fucking Kagawa and Fellaini, two Man United players in your team, and there's no Man United or Spurs players allowed. And you've not even had the sense to take out your goalkeeper, who's actually died. I told you I've not looked at it. <laughs> the, the goalkeeper got injured in like the second. Is it Stecklenburg that I got in goal? Yes. Bless you. Yeah, fine. It's all right. Like I said, See, uh, I told you he was a closet Man United fan. He'll just have to take a, a, a yellow a yellow card, one one week ban. Yeah, that, let, let me take. Let me forty second. I'll make. I'm going to make a few 
transfers, and then you'll be crying into your cheddars, you prick. Oh, look at you! You've got you've gone all chopsy on. You've got I've strata. gone all defensive. Strata, sort him out. Strata. <laughs> Seriously, if I could be bored, I'd fucking drive down to Wales and stamp on his size fucking twelve feet. I tell you what, you you come into the of that, and your fucking wheels would be gone within fifteen seconds. I'll take the hubcaps off first. Don't worry about that. <laughs> a bit of time. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move on to some shout outs then, and we'll go to you first, Strutter. Uh, yeah, just one shout out. Uh, poor Nick at Pirebury Corner. Wish you all the best. Uh, get back on your feet. Uh, yeah, love to you both. Okay, Danny. A um, little bit about the Pirebury Corner. Good luck to the bloke who was the injured bloke who said he's going to try and be back for the. He swore that he's going to be back for the Norwich game. So get well soon to you. I, just, yeah. I was just reading on their Facebook page, and what a very nice shot. I've never seen the, a picture of Pirebury Corner. What a beautiful looking place that is. It's very nice looking. All it's all done in black. With you can sit out the front, and there's a picture of an old Italian lady having it a, bit of, a It used to be a Moroccan fucking coke den. Did it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Before, that, before that, way back, it was a proper pie and mash shop. Oh yeah, back in the back in the seventies, it was a. I mean, my uh, my mum used to bunk off school and go there for a pie and mash. Back in the uh, that must have been back in the sixties. I yeah. thought you were going to say some drugs or something then. No, she no, she no, quit no. school to go and take was, some heroin. She was a sorry. mule. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll I want to you, say... I you, you, think, you think I'm tough, mate. My mum would fucking slaughter you. My mum's four foot, four foot ten and goes, Ha, diddy diddy hello to yourself. Uh, what <laughs> could the caravan to me with no fucking wheels? There you go, that's daddy's <laughs> mum. Do yeah, well, every time I did my shopping and I have my do my Sainsbury's online shopping and every week I have to buy four big bags of marshmallows and she goes in there and she scoffs a lot but she always leaves one in the bag. The, the, the psychology of leaving one in the bag, I've got no idea. So I go and polish off the single ones. Anyway, I want to say hello to Paul Mason who is at P Mason AFC and also say hello to Charlie who is at C G D R I C U C C I who I went to play. So I was sitting in bed on the old Samsung Galaxy Tab playing a Scrabble game and then I just put on there, linked it to my Twitter and then I got a few people playing me one was him and one was Mr Axe I didn't even know there were people that followed me and then I found out you can buy an app for it that helps you do the words so I thought fuck it I'm never using it again so hello to you two and get well soon to matey boy so Danny's been playing with some of his followers this week no, this okay. was about two months ago oh Raj you next a uh, couple uh, Neil Lawrence good gooner at Neil Odor, O-D-O-R, and also a guy called Nick at SWL Guna. Both good lads, always worth a follow, talk sense. And uh, I've also been asked to tell you guys uh, that Amanda from the Guna Girls is desperate to come on your podcast, so I'm just passing oh, that message on. Fuck that, yeah. would nobody get a fucking word in edgeways with her. Uh, she came on the Transfer Deadline podcast. She's, she's had a fill. She wants to yeah. put a go at Very unfortunate choice of words. She wants yeah. to, if she wants to fill again, I've got to make sure FK's on. I, I, I'm here all I week. Have, I have heard that she likes a certain fisting German or, <laughs> or fisting a German or something oh, like that. Go and listen to their podcast. It's absolutely fantastic. That's not even a shout out anyway. So that's just free promotion. It's a very good podcast. As long, as, long as they're not playing Nopoli. Silence. Uh, <laughs> if you listen to their podcast, you'd get that. And Steve, yeah. your shout out, please. Oh my yeah, God. I've got um, I've got three this week. Uh, first one is to a Polish Guna, Mariusz, and you can find him at Mariusz underscore AFC. And another guy I've been talking to for a long time, uh, David, who is at twenty three David, who's a top guy, and two ladies now. Uh, at Sweet AFC Jane, who's a very funny uh, lady with a very uh, ribald, uh, salacious sense of humour. And the last one goes to Miss Black, who's a 12 pins regular and one of the bad gang of drunken uh, female AFC fans who likes singing a lot and wearing hats. So that's Miss Black at Miss Black 01. And finally, Jules. Yeah, just a couple. Uh, first shout out, obviously, to the Pirby Corner. Hope everyone kind of. Is okay and comes back comes back well. Um, and the second one's just for my brother, really. Uh, my brother's ill uh, at the moment in hospital, so shout out to Dean um, and hope you get better soon. And that's it. Fantastic. And my shout out for this week goes to a podcast friend. It's underscore 
Well, oh, under yeah, it is underscore, isn't it? Oh, Armchair no, no, no. Gooner, Mister James Raoul Stokes. Stokes. Um, so that shout out was brought to you by Rovers in the red light district of Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to mention they, his podcast? Yes, he does no. a very good podcast. Uh, three oh. is it three blokes talking ass? No, that's Dylan's one. Um, they're uh, the one that Daniel and oh fuck him, uh, they can have a shout out too. <laughs> the one Daniel and uh, James is doing is Goonosphere, and the one. Dylan is doing his three blokes talking ass, and they're both very, very good. Yes, uh, James gave me a, a rather a nice shout out on this week's podcast. And well, Dylan did for me as well. Cheers, Dylan, you cheeky so, Scottish heroin addict lookalike. Yes. So, <laughs> me and Danny would both like to thank you. And also, uh, the final one for this week is uh, Chloe the Geek. Uh, I'm sure that you guys knew that she was going to be on the podcast this week, but unfortunately there's been a bereavement in the family. So we just wanted to send her the best and hope that this shout-out cheers her up and say that she'll be on real, real soon. So that's about it then. I'd like to thank all of you guys for joining me and Danny tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. It's been a pleasure. It's just been great not. It's just great not to have to speak to Jeff. <laughs> how how was the not swearing worked out for you, uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, no, I think I've done well tonight. I've only said the c word a few times. Uh, um, obviously, it, it was Danny's fault, really. I mean, he had to mention that. Sorry, well, you we could refer to him as the Viking. You yeah, no, it turned oh, into a bit of a joke, but you chose not to swear, so we thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, so, no, you know, it's, it's always nice Jeff? to be nice and polite. Jeff, where is Jeff? Jeff? Where is Jeff? Anyway, is he in the bowels of his uh, corporate entertainment bunker somewhere in no, North he, London? Or he was he was last seen. His ankles were last seen out of the rear end of Arsenal Wenger. <laughs> 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 Saying there's room for one more. Yeah, let me in. Let me in. I love so, you. I just I, I just get, I just get this image of Jeff sneaking around the changing rooms, like nicking Wenger's phone and going through the text. I reckon that text to see to get where he gets his inside no, info no, no. from. I reckon that I, no, he's, he's fucking sniffing fucking Kashelny's socks, the pervert. <laughs> That's a Twitter name waiting to be used, Kashelny's well, socks. We we love you, Jeff. Anyway, so yeah, we do really. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you very much for listening, and keep it Arsenal. Good night. Bonjour, cheeky monkey bitches. <laughs>